Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. In my case, because who I married was Warren Jeffs, um, it made it more complicated because he was the leader, and if I lied to him, the repercussion would be pretty great. Because he's the one that groomed me too. Like he was my principal in school. My first grade teacher was his first wife. Mm. He had a bunch of doctrines that said you're supposed to love your sister wives. You're supposed to sacrifice for them. And in my situation, I didn't love him. So I was like, you can have, you know, he had tons of wives. I never cared. Over time, he realized that I wasn't attracted to him too. Because like whenever I'd walk in the room, it was like a frozen and it would infuriate him. If you aren't already being hunted in the house because you're on 24-hour watch, which I was, after I started questioning, I started realizing that there was problems everywhere. It felt like a concentration camp to me where most people wanted to be there. So I was targeted so bad after he realized he could never make me an accomplice, a full accomplice. I would stay awake at night. I would fight sleep because I was afraid of being strangled at times like you know there was so much going into it one guy actually said he left the church because he was told to kill me oh my gosh Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. Leave those words of encouragement for our guests. It means so much to them. Remember, they read the comments. And it's just amazing to have such a supportive community for our guests who are coming on and bravely telling their stories. So today's guest, I found found her through doing some research, looking for some more FLDS members. Um, we're diving into the LeBaron group soon, and I'll explain all of that when we get there. But the FLDS is the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so it's a branch off of Mormonism. I come from the mainstream Mormon church, Brielle here, she comes from the Fundamentalist side, and this is the, the sect that was run or is run by Warren Jeffs, who is now currently in prison for CSA. So today's guest, she was actually married to Warren Jeffs as his 65th wife. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing her childhood growing up in the FLDS and talking about her experiences with Warren, how she was moved around multiple times. And in the next episode, because there's so much to cover, we're going to discuss how she was finally able to escape and eventually go on to create what's called the Dream Center, where she's helping other survivors and other people who are trying to leave get out of that community. So thank you so much for joining us, Brielle Decker. Hi, good to be here. Yeah, it's so great to have you. I just have to start out by saying, I know we're going to talk about this in the next episode, but I love what you're doing with the Dream Center and the fact that it was actually Warren Jeff's home prior just makes it so much sweeter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love working here. So like it's a, it's a it's a beautiful turnaround, you know, like you talk about the 180. I think that's really important. In my story, I do have that for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you are also on a documentary called Prisoner of the Prophet, and that's on HBO Max. Right. And Discovery Plus. So. And Discovery Plus. So it's a three part or three episode documentary that talks about Warren Jeffs, the shady things he was getting into. And you were kind of the face of this story. We're following through um, what you had to go through from your perspective. And it's just a really powerful documentary. So if anyone is interested after watching this, you can go um, watch that as well. So, Brielle, let's just get into, for those who aren't familiar, a brief overview of the fundamentalist LDS church, kind of the rules, how you grew up, the environment that you were in. The difference between um, mainstream and FLDS is basically polygamy. That was the breakoff. And then um, later on, like the, the prophets change, the leaders of the church change quite a bit between both of them. They're different from the breakoff. And then when you get down to Warren Jeffs, he, a big difference between both of them is um, he really emphasizes that the children are the prophets and they're God's children. So that's how he separates families. He's really big into 
selecting who is worthy of blessings and even down to children he he'll he's so quick to take away children from parents Mm. and in the mainstream mormon church they're more focused on family staying together yeah and and it's all about interpretation of the same doctrines joseph smith was the founder of mormons we have the same foundational doctrines but the prophets interpreted them quite a bit different over the time frame and a lot of people will try to separate themselves from the FLDS or any breakoffs in general, which makes sense. I can understand that. I was one of them that was like, they're not doing it right. That's not how it works. But in reality, the FLDS are following the doctrine of Joseph Smith, the original prophet, even more closely than the mainstream church today, who has kind of distanced themselves from those things. Not to say that Warren wasn't extreme because he did take things way out of proportion, but ultimately... That's what it is, is the fundamentalist version of Mormonism. Would you agree? I I like to say um, it's kind of like parenting. Like there's a big extreme on one side, you know, that you could have like physical things. You could have like mental things. There's so many different varieties. I like to compare it to that because like I don't like to say that FLDS is more like God. I mean, they might be living what, what Joseph Smith originally taught more fully, but like it doesn't mean they're closer to God at all. Oh, of course. Because I have tried living something that is more, um, like I'm, I'm basic Christian now. So like they believe in an all-powerful God. They don't focus so hard on works. You know, it's it's a lot different. And I've tried living believing in something really extreme, and I've also tried believing in something not so extreme. And it takes just as much faith to believe in anything. So I don't know why we would choose the most extreme personally. Yeah. It's definitely interesting, especially when you look at the psychology of the leaders and you tend to realize that the extreme leaders are the ones who are doing things pretty much just to fit their own needs and wants. But they're like, nope, the scriptures say, like you said, the misinterpretation of things just to give them more usually power, money, and sex is like the, the crux of being a cult leader, right? So... Before Warren came into power, Rulin was the leader. And I've heard from previous interviews people saying, yeah, it was actually a pretty good time when Rulin was the leader. There wasn't anything too crazy. It's when Warren came into power that things really dramatically changed. So I'd like to hear from your perspective, because you were a child when this happened, what those differences were and kind of how you acclimated to those changes. So one thing with me was I was not originally born in Colorado City. I was born in Sandy, Utah, so um, where the FLDS Alta Academy was. So there was a little bit of a difference when that shift happened, when he became the leader. But he was basically the one that ran. He was the principal of Alta Academy. So all my childhood, he was basically around. So I didn't have like in Colorado City is like a it's an older compound. I like to call it an older compound of FLDS. It's in Colorado, like Colorado City, Arizona, and Hillville, Utah. It's right on the border. Mm-hmm. It's about four hours away from Sandy, Utah, where I was born, even though I was born in the FLDS. Um, Warren Jeffs was up there in Sandy the whole time that I was raised. So I don't have such a difference because um, even though he wasn't the prophet yet, and it did change quite a bit when he became the prophet, but it was still him Mm -hmm. around me my whole childhood. So people that lived in Colorado City and Hilldale, Utah, they usually tell that version that you're explaining. They say it was a lot different before, but he wasn't there in their lives as as consistently Mm -hmm. as as he was in mine because I was in the location where he was my whole childhood. Okay, that makes sense. So what are the rules then that changed when he came into power? So the things that changed when he became into power was that was about the time frame that I was, I turned 18. So he, he, he became a leader like a few months before my 18th birthday. And that's when I married him. And so like it became different, quite a bit different because I got to know him on a personal level, which wasn't my parents' ter- interpretation of him anymore. It was my interpretations of him. And he didn't live the doctrine like my parents interpreted it. Mm. So a lot of people will say, like, you know, I've heard people out in the world who have listened to some of his doctrine and stuff. They say it sounds kind of like it makes sense. I'm like, well, he didn't live that way. It doesn't matter if it makes sense if they're not living according to how they're instructing other people to live. Mm -hmm. So in my perspective and in my experience with him, 
he was not how my parents interpreted the doctrine. He didn't even try to live up to it, really, because he didn't have to. He was like, he usurped authority in the beginning, like, to become the leader. He basically, he was he was Ruland's son, and he taught all the children in Alta Academy where I went to school. God will choose the leader, and the people don't have a say in that. God chooses them, and it's not about a vote. So basically, he usurped authority when he, when his father passed away. He stood up in church, and he just he got witnesses that would testify that he was. But it, it all started in Sandy, Utah, first, where he had already taught all the children for years and years and years and years that that's how it was going to be. Now God chose me, so what are you going to do about it? Are you going to testify for me? So the people who basically did testify for him had had that previous doctrine taught to them for quite a few years before that. Okay. He usurped authority, and then um, it was right. He became the leader right before I turned 18 years old. I had all those experiences personally with him that were different than I was expecting. So I saw red flags on the very first day. My wedding was definitely a secret wedding. My mother was not invited to it. Um, he was running from the law, so he didn't want anybody really to know about it, except for he did invite my father. My father was crying when he brought me there. My mother did rec like before like I was making dinner the day that it happened my father walked in the room and my mother recognized the look on his face and I had just turned 18 so she actually screamed no mm. like my parents were scared and they couldn't really express a lot other than that my father turned to me and he said let's go on a drive and during that time frame that had happened to other girls that were 18 years old or even younger, but they would go on this drive and they would never come home. Can I ask your opinion on this? Because from the documentary and from what I've heard, it seems if you were really invested in the church and invested in the prophet, seer and revelator as the one true prophet, as Mormonism teaches and fundamentalist Mormonism teaches, yeah. that it would seem to be an honor to be married to the prophet. Yeah. In most families, it would be an honor. And I did experience that also in the community when I moved down to Hilda. My best friend also married Warren before me. And I mentioned it to her once. I'm scared. And she told me, she's like, well, it would be an honor to marry the prophet. But she came from a heritage that had, because I had a sister that went into Warren's family before me. So I already knew the dynamics of how I would probably be treated. I don't think I would be different than my sister. And then she also had sisters that were married to Warren. And they were treated really well. Where my sister never had kids. Like, you know, there was a lot of factors that diff differed between the way they were treated in his family. And mm -hmm. I noticed that. So when she told me it'd be an honor, I was like kind of surprised. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, her heritage factored into that most likely. Okay. Because she came from a well-known family that was just really highly respected. And our family was basically had a broken chain. So like Warren Jeffs himself has like seven generations in FLDS. My grandparents on my mother's side were converts to the church. And my grandparents on my father's side were kicked out when I was 13 years old. So there was a there wasn't a seven generation. And basically it means that you're more brainwashed, but they don't say that. They say you're more indoctrinated, you're more trained, you know how to react and how to respond to things, situations. So even in his family, there was a pyramid. Mm -hmm. Like the church is set up like a pyramid. He's at the top. They have the bishops, they have the fathers, the mothers, the children. Well, in his family, there was a pyramid also, according to who was his favorite wife. You know, he didn't have a rotation cycle. His father did have a rotation cycle where every wife got a turn after so many days, but he did not. When I went into his family, he's like, God will tell me if you're ever worthy. Oh, wow. That's a lot of pressure to put on you because on one hand, you're probably thinking, I don't want to spend time with you. But then on the other hand, you're thinking, am I not worthy to spend time with you? Yeah. I, yeah. Like a lot of the wives, it did hurt them pretty bad, I believe. Yeah. Because like they were always trying to do everything he said and it didn't really have anything to do with that. It had to do with like attraction and, you know, other things that, he, that factored into it that he, there was no control over that. You know what I mean? And if he didn't like him, then they weren't going to get a turn. It didn't matter if. God said or not, you know, didn't really have anything to do with that. But in my mind, I didn't like him. So I didn't really care. And I wasn't, and I, I'm pretty bold about like saying I wasn't really hurt by polygamy itself. 
I do believe it's harder to live. And even in their own doctrine, they say it's harder to live. When you add multiple perspectives into a situation, it's not going to get easier. Mm -hmm. And I believe personally that if you have one person in the family that's really negative and really like complaining attitude, it can actually upset the whole family. Mm -hmm. It can ruin the whole situation for everybody else because they're always trying to like be manipulative and they're trying to, it's kind of like a jealousy factor eventually. But I do believe it's not impossible. Polygamy is not impossible that you can find situations, but it's super hard. And I do think that without the religious to begin with, like without working through those, those hard situations with religion in the background, it's almost impossible. Like I do believe there are people who have left the church and still try to work out those differences, and, but they've also been trained by the church first. Mm. It's not a normal situation for sure. And to actually live polygamy, it kind of have to have like the right situation and not only the right situation, you kind of have to have a strong enough force behind you to work through the differences and understand how patriarchy is the head of it. Yeah. And that's the thing because I, it's not to say I don't think consenting adults should do whatever they want to do. Sure. If you want to engage in those type of relationships or polyamory, which I believe is very different situation than polygamy, then by all means. But I think what we see here is a lot of coercion, spiritual manipulation, um, abuse. There's a lot of factors that make it so these women don't really have a choice, even if it appears that way. And before we get into the ceremony, because I do want to talk about that, your sister was actually married to Rulin first. And then yeah. Warren kind of just took over all of his wives too, which is also something that they didn't consent to. They married somebody. They didn't choose to be married to the son of that person. It's just really tricky. Did your sister ever talk to you about how she felt about that? Um, she she really couldn't, but like all the re marriages in the church were descended by the leader. Yeah. They were all arranged marriages. And if you did choose, it was kind of seen really bad. It was almost worthy of blood atonement to date by the time I was married. Yeah. And blood atonement, for those who don't know, it's something that was it Joseph Smith or Brigham Young that first enforced it? Do you know? I think it was talked about mostly in the FLDS during the time when polygamy was changed over. So like there was a guy named Joseph F. Smith that was a prophet of the LDS, I believe, after John, after Wolf of Woodruff. But they in the FLDS, they have like a story about how he died blood atonement because he was actually living polygamy behind the scenes and oh, testifying against it. On, and the only way that could work is if he died blood atonement. But I don't know if it's true, but they did tell us that story in our history lessons. So this is going to be, it's going to become relevant in your story, which is why I wanted to clarify it now. But there have been accounts in Brigham Young's time where if you don't repent, and you can tell me if it was different in the FLDS, but from my understanding, if you are not repentant of something and the people who love you want you to go to heaven and you're like, no, I don't want to do that, then they should slit your throat and spill your blood on the ground and that ensures you get to heaven. Is that how it was for you guys? That's how their doctrine was. But like when it actually came down to it, it was more secretive. It was a lot more secretive. Like I, I was shocked by how, how much they believed in it. And it's kind of like a parable thing. Like they could add this parable thing to almost any doctrine and basically say, well, that was what we tell people because we can't do that publicly. Jeez, it's just shocking that they still believe that. And I actually wasn't aware that the FLDS still practiced blood atonement in any capacity until hearing your story. I know of the LeBaron group, which we're going to get into in future episodes, practiced openly. But that's so terrifying that today they would think, oh, yeah, just murder them. I mean... It's shocking. Well, the thing is, is in FLDS, uh, it's not always looked at like blood atonement. But like the problem is, is that they started out separating the children from the parents. So they don't really know if they're even alive. They think they're all in the other house. The only people really looking for them are the ex-FLDS or the people on the outside. There's nobody 
inside of their thinking, oh, they probably died blood atoma and they're gone in that other house. Like they they just think they're always somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So they don't really even know if they're alive. And even if they did find out, it would be still covered. If they're like, I haven't seen this person for so many years. Are they even alive? You know, it would be covered. It would never be disclosed of what really happened. Jeez. It would be like a secret or it would be like they were just unworthy or, you know, it wouldn't be blood atonement. It would never be worded like that. Mm-hmm. It would be worded. Like I do know of people, like even Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred was a bishop in Colorado City during the time that Rulin was the prophet. And he died basically from Warren Jeffs saying, God revealed that you don't need your medicine anymore for diabetes. <sighs> and then he died. So like they don't say it's blood atonement, but it very well could have been mm-hmm. told to him that it was blood atoma. Yeah. How would they know? They just kind of smooth them over. And so like the general XFLDS don't always say it was blood atoma unless you go through those experiences and survive them. That's the only way to really get the stories where they say, well, it was told to me that it was blood atoma. Mm-hmm. And then in those situations, usually your health has been attacked so strongly that a lot of people still question it. That's terrifying. Yeah, they don't want people to, if they, if you, when I was targeted, they told me you're either going to die, you're going to become so crazy, nobody will believe you anyway. It's part of their whole structure of hiding their things is to target your health, to, um, to say or else kill you and then you never can talk about it anyway. Or you're going to join the secret group that does this to people. Or you're going to escape somehow and talk about it and see if anybody believes you. Yeah. Which is what I ultimately did. They weren't going to let me escape. But like, yeah, they said if you do, then we're, we can't do things publicly, basically. Okay. Wow. So that's a sneak preview for what's coming. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot to talk about, guys. So first, I want to get back to you're driving in the car with your dad. He's clearly visibly upset. Your mom's upset. You know how your sister has been handed down and how she's been treated by Warren. And you are driving at night to this undisclosed location. So let's have you pick it up from there. Okay. So and my father's crying drives me to this location. It was actually Rulin's house. And then somebody came out and escorted us to where Warren was, which was actually one of his brother's houses that was not in the same compound. So like not in the gates. Um, They took me to another location in town. We sat in the waiting room for a little while. Somebody came down at one of it, one of this, I can't remember who it was. I think it was one of his brother's wives came in and escorted us up to the right room. And then Warren was sitting in there. We sat down in front of him. He kind of went over some of the the basic things. So he had, like, in his doctrine, three different routes of asking people about marriage. And it was really a hard line. It was in his doctrine even. It's like, if you lie to God, you're going to be punished for that. If you cross the line and say anything about, like, who you're going to marry, that could also have repercussions for it. So even in his doctrine, he says that. And so I was always praying that I would not be asked if I had any revelations from God myself for my own life, because there was two tied up lines right there. There was, it was really a catch 22s. There was, it's like standing on the edge of a cliff and being asked, which way do you want to jump off? Because there's really no way of not getting a repercussion and you're going to blame yourself if you get asked that question. So the first route was he could just tell me, and that's the one I wanted. But I always felt like it wouldn't be that for me. When you walked in and sat down in front of him, did you think that you were having a meeting with him and he was going to tell you who your husband was? Or did you know at that point? Well, I hoped that he would just tell me. I figured that that he was going to, it was going to end in marriage. But I didn't know who it would be and neither did my father. I There was three routes of him being able to disclose that to us because he had the ultimate say in whatever happened. But the second route was, or the third route would be pretty harsh on me. I would blame myself for anything that happened in our marriage later. It would like eat me alive. You know, like if anything came up, I'd be like, oh, did I do that right? Maybe I did that wrong. Mm. You know, like I just bully myself over that topic if I had any say in it. And the reason why is because he had the ultimate say in the end. But like 
I would like if I if I piped up and said anything, there's a high chance that he would decide anyway. And then I would be like, oh, did I do that right? In my case, because who I married was Warren Jeffs, um, it made it more complicated because he was the leader. And if I lied to him, the repercussion would be pretty great. Because he's the one that groomed me too. Like he was my principal in school. My first grade teacher was his first wife. Like it was a pretty big deal in my situation. I didn't really want to lie to him because he was the one that groomed me. Mm -hmm. He was the one that prepped me for this day. So like it was a really big catch me too for me. Because he's like, who? because he did go to the second the second um, route. So that he didn't just tell me that I was supposed to marry him. I don't know if he does that to any of his wives or not, but like in my situation, he asked me if God revealed to me who I was supposed to marry, which is the second route. The third route is a little more harsh where you have to pray over it and go find the person that you're supposed to marry and then come ask him. And if he says no, you know what I mean? Like some of that Mm -hmm. you can really overthink. In my situation, he asked me if I had any revelations from God and I looked away from him and I just said, I wondered if it was if I was supposed to go in the family with my sister, because I didn't want to lie to him. And I also didn't want to put like decide, you know, and then have him turn me away, you know, that would be bad too. So like Yeah. But I, I didn't really want to marry him. But I just didn't really my main factor was I didn't want to lie to him. I didn't want to if he was really grooming me like I had suspected, I didn't know how to just say, Well, I don't believe that that was you know, I was misinterpreting all of that through all these years. But also like part of the situation was I had a friend who um, left the church at 14, who went to school with me in the FLDS homeschool. She got an immediate interview and she said, I left because I was afraid that I was being groomed to marry Warren Jess. And uh, my siblings, like it played a lot into my life at that childhood stage at 14. Um, My siblings laughed at her and said she was never going to. She should have just stuck it out and find out that she wasn't going to marry him anyway. So in my mind, I made these commitments the whole way through my childhood. The peer pressure was a huge deal in the FLDS homeschools. You you should stay loyal forever. Why would anybody not? You know, like, and everybody makes these commitments to themselves every day. It wasn't just a small thing where, you know, when you grow up and you start to realize that this might have been like misconstrued, then you, you know, the doctrine and stuff that you were given may have been um, just put like manipulation, you know, when you start to realize there's other factors and maybe that's why people left, then you kind of have to deny your own commitments to yourself. Yeah. You kind of have to say, well, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have committed to stay loyal all the time. <laughs> like I didn't realize that there was going to be so much more when my brain fully develops, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is sometimes at 26. So part of those commitments was I made a commitment that I wanted to find out. And then when it came down to it, when he confirmed after I said, I wondered if it was my sister, he's like, you have a strong testimony of God. You're right. Um, then I didn't want to find out. Anymore. <laughs> like, I don't want to find out anymore. But you know, like part of the problem was I also didn't have enough education to know what marriage was even about. Mm. So like, and in my situation, I also felt like I didn't need that education very bad because my sister never had kids. You know, I was 18 years old. Yeah, sex education. Like I didn't have, um, I did have a, a bad experience as a, as a child where I was molested, but I never, like he never took off his clothes. And my mother never came and gave me sex education about the guy. Mm. So like I didn't realize, and I also thought I'd never have any kids. So I didn't really... And we didn't have like a lot of internet. We didn't have a lot of books. And so I, I, I was curious my whole life. I did have enough knowledge to know that, that there were things I were missing. Yeah. Even my siblings told me like, has mother ever came and gave you the sex education? And I was like, no. And they're like, oh, well, she will. She came to me three times and, you know, stuff like that. And she never did. And I also was teased a lot about Mary and Warren Jeff. So she, it may have been something she thought about. And didn't want to give it to me in case that was what happened. If I'm understanding correctly, so you were given no sex education. You didn't really understand anatomy, how reproduction works, but you knew that something happened. And now you are in a room with Warren Jeffs, who is, how old is he at this point? He was 50. Oh, fi- oh my goodness gracious. So he's 50 years old. You're 18. And you're just now realizing, 
I'm going to have to be a wife and I don't really know what that means. And is your dad still in the room with you at this point? No, he, they sent him out after the ceremony. So I could say yes or no at the ceremony at this point, even though he confirmed that I was supposed to marry him, it would just be a higher punishment if I didn't say yes at the ceremony. Okay. I said, I wondered if I was supposed to go in that family. And he says, yes, you have a strong testimony of God. So it kind of just pushed me into like saying yes at the ceremony. Cause I was like, now I know who he wants me to marry, but like, I don't want to yeah. say no, because then the punishment will be even greater than if I didn't know. Yeah. So what are your thoughts and feelings about Warren at this time? Because you said you'd had some kind of creepy experiences with him when you were younger and you felt like you were being groomed. How how are you perceiving him right now as you're going through this marriage ceremony with him? I was terrified of him. I was so scared of him. So when, when the ceremony went through, I remember he was mouthing the words the whole time and I couldn't do that because I didn't it's my first wedding, his like 65th. So like he knew exactly what the ceremony was like. He had it in the books, exactly how it was written. He had his brother do the ceremony, but he was like mouthing it. And there was a kiss at the end. There was no ring yet. He did give me a ring later, which was weird, but whatever. Then he sent my father. I was really fast. He sent my father out of the room and the brother. He sat on a chair and he's like, come sit on my lap. And mm. I hesitated because like I was scared like I said like before and I was kind of in shock after he confirmed that I was supposed to marry him I kind of went into like a kind of a foggy yeah foggier feeling so I hesitated and I immediately saw the anger on his face he was so angry because like he had taught me my whole life I can't date it's worthy of blood atoma I knew all that stuff but as soon as marriage happens you're supposed to reverse it and I guess in his situation it was supposed to be immediate and I couldn't do that it was like biologically impossible pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he was very angry with me and he called my father back in the room. I did sit on his lap that day after I hesitated and saw the anger in his face. Then I walked over and I sat on his lap. He did touch me all over and I just kind of just was so numbed out that I just sat there and he finally just said, sit out across this, you know, sit over on the chair across from me. So I sat over there and he's like, are you close to your mother? And I said, no, I'm not because I hadn't been close to my mother, which was unfortunate. And he said, okay. And he called my father, told him to come back. I don't know where he was, but my father came back in the room and he gave him a bunch of instructions about like, he wanted me to go to a specific meeting in the morning. He wanted me to um, go home that night with my family. And he didn't want me to teach school. I had been teaching a homeschool as an assistant, like in fourth grade. Um, for like the last two months before that because I was like in 11th grade but they didn't have 11th grade in school so they just had me be teaching that year so I did go home my family was not expecting to see me really or or they were kind of expecting to see me with with the guy who I married or whatever because some of my other siblings would come home with their husband or mm. whatever. but um, they had cleaned up the house they had made the meal they were sitting in the living room when I walked in and I, and I couldn't even tell them. That was one of the instructions was like, you cannot even tell them that you're married. That you're married. What? Yeah. So I walked in and everybody was just like watching me and asking me, are you married? Are you married? And I couldn't answer their question. So I just laughed at every single time. I would just laugh at everything. And the next, that night, like I slept in a room with my sister. So she went to sleep. I waited till she fell asleep. Then I got up and I packed my clothes because I was supposed to um, get a few things ready just in case, like whenever they decided I was going to leave, I needed to have some things packed. My mother slipped a note under my door and it's, it was like a, I, I know she said something about like, I'm your mother and I know you really are married, even though you can't tell me. And it was just by the way I was acting. She could read read that. Mm -hmm. And then and then my father that night told everybody we had to go to the meeting in the morning, which was a work project meeting. It was actually the last time that Warren Jeffs went to a public meeting in Colorado City. So you have to remember, like, I was born in Sandy, Utah, but I moved down to Colorado City with my family at 16 when the Olympics happened. So that was kind of a big thing. Mm -hmm. So I married him at 18. And... um. So we went to that meeting and that meeting was a pretty um, traumatic meeting for most people. He walked down the aisles. He gave out corrections to men who had sat on the stand who were very well respected in the community and had been for basically my whole life. So um, 
he handed them corrections, told them they were no longer married to the wife sitting next to them. And I'm sitting in this audience, like he told me to be here. You know, like I was furious because like the doctrine says you're supposed to have persuasion through love. And he taught that you're supposed to have persuasion through love, especially after marriage. This was nothing like that. There was no persuasion through love. This was basically sending me a message that there's no hope. And he requested I be there. So if I had heard about that later, I don't think it would have sent off such a red flag in my mind. Mm -hmm. But because he was breaking the rules, it really sent off some red flags. And then I went to a meeting directly after that. My father, when he walked out of that meeting, he drove me directly to another secret meeting that Warren Jeffs was having with a few of his wives. It wasn't even all of them. And I sat in that meeting and he was talking about when he took away his children from the property in where they grew up in Hilda, Utah. And he said he was running from the law. He didn't want the law to find his children and question them. So that made sense why he was taking his children to his secret location. And then he opened up and he said, but God revealed that not one of the mothers that gave birth could go with their children at that time. Oh, And so that, that was a big red flag for me. I couldn't tell anyone, but in my mind, I was like, I need to go check on the children because their mothers aren't with them. Yeah. So I was a wife that never gave birth so I could go. But the mothers that gave birth at that time couldn't go. So he ripped away like 30 mothers' children in one day. And he talked about the whole story. It was so traumatic. I remember thinking, I want to go check on those children. And so I did become, that's actually the main reason why I went into Texas and all of those places and got so deep in there and so trapped in there was because I first made a commitment to go check on those children. I kind of became the witness from the inside. And that's where he took them, was out of the state. Yeah, he took them to Texas. So for me, um, when I got in there, I realized that the children were being rotated. It was worse than adoption. Every time they would bond with their caretaker that he assigned over them, he would rotate them. So it wasn't safe for them. Mm. Like in adoption, you have the hope of bonding. Mm Mm-hmm. And staying like connected, you know, like building from there. But in this situation, there was no hope of that. Yeah. They would always be on edge. They would never, if they had a deep secret inside, they wouldn't tell anyone because they wouldn't trust anyone. So before you went to Texas, did you live with Warren and other wives in the home that's now the Dream Center? I didn't. I, I came back here. Okay. After I went to Texas, then he sent me to here because. I was, I don't really know why he sent me away, but he told me to go write a confession letter because I wouldn't talk to him. Mm. He had put me on the spot so many times in public situations. When I went, I stayed at my father's house for two weeks. Then he took me to Texas. And when I went there, he kept telling me in front of everybody, I'm sorry I sent you home on the first night. And I was like, I don't really care. Because at first I didn't even register that it was a punishment. Oh, but later, after he kept saying it, he'd say it right after each other. I'd say, I don't really care. You know, that's fine. And he's like, I'm sorry I sent you home on the first night. You know, he kept saying it and saying it until I registered, oh, that was a punishment for hesitating. Yeah. And and I didn't really love him. Like, I didn't have, I was actually not even attracted to him. I kind of believed in God when I married him. But I didn't really, you know, and you're, when you marry him, it's supposed to be an honor because you're supposed to be able to make it to God. So that was like a big thing to me is that I did want to see God again, but I didn't really love him. Mm -hmm. It just became worse over time because like he had a bunch of doctrines that said you're supposed to love your sister wives. You're supposed to sacrifice for them. And in my situation, I didn't love him. So I was like, you can have, you know, everything that I would get. You know, I never cared if they, you know, he had tons of wives. So I never would get a turn. I didn't really care if I didn't get a turn at all, you know, like in any situation. And it would infuriate him because he, he oh, over time he realized that I wasn't attracted to him too because like whenever I'd walk in the room, it was like a frozen situation. It wasn't like a normal situation where you would um, want to be around them. Yeah. It was like fear-based. And he had 85 or 87 wives. He had 79 by the time he went to prison, according to the Texas records. Okay. There's different numbers all over, but it depends on who you're talking to. But I think he may have even married some wives spiritually since he went to prison. Oh, my gosh. I'm not sure about that. 
Okay, let's yeah. talk a little bit about Texas. So for those who aren't familiar, it's this enormous compound that he had built. And of course, everyone in the area is looking like, what's going on here? Why is this thing being built? It was very secretive, guarded. I want to hear from your perspective what that was like being a part of it. So when we moved, first moved there, it was trailers. Um, they were building their first building. So we didn't realize that he had applied for that land and told them something completely different he was going to do with it. We didn't know any of that. He never told us that. Mm -hmm. He just was telling us that we're building this property. It's going to be this, you know, this house. And we couldn't go over where the men were. We had to stay with his family. We had his children there. But um, so some of the boys were there, but like they were pretty young and um, for me, it was a little interesting because he put me in survival mode from day one, which I thought was really weird. Most of his wives, he would rotate from every chore, like every month. So like basically they'd be on cook for a month then they'd rotate until they're on sewing for a month and they rotate. Well, when I married him, I went to Texas. He put me on every single one of those for an hour every day. So I was literally running from one job to the other. And by the time I got home at night, I would crash sleep. And then in the mornings, I wouldn't wake up on time because I was so tired at night. And my sister was there and she was like waking me up in the mornings. And I was just like so exhausted. She couldn't understand why I didn't have. And he also, he, he kind of targeted me from the day one. I don't really know all the reasons why. There's a lot of assumption around it. But like he told me, so he tells me to pack my clothes when I'm in Colorado City, you know, get some things ready. And then I do pack my clothes. I get there in Texas where there's like no stores around. There's no way he's not going to let me go to a store. There's no telephones. Um, he had a telephone, but like they're burner phones. So he'd throw them away every time he used it, you know, and try not to use it on the property to hide, to keep his location secret. But one of the things he told me was like, when I got to the property and there's no way to change the situation, He's telling me, well, we changed the style of our dresses. We don't wear those same dresses anymore that you have packed. We have dresses that have like straight waist. Fortunately, there was a sister wife standing close by that overheard the conversation. There wasn't even any fabric or sewing machines on the property. I had a sewing machine, but I didn't bring it with me because he didn't tell me to. He just said, bring clothes. Mm -hmm. We It was just beginning. And for him to target me like that was so weird. He had a, so I had a sister wife who overheard the conversation and donated me three dresses. So I had three dresses that I could wear just because she donated them to me. So I was supposed to be really grateful that she even did. Yeah. Which I was grateful, but like, it was just weird that he would do that. You know, that was just weird. Like, why would you tell me now that I'm here where I can't change the situation that I can't wear any of my clothes? That's just weird, isn't it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's so weird. And we forgot to mention in the beginning what those clothes look like. So they kind of look like prairie dresses with the longer sleeves and kind of poofy and pastel colors. And he had a bunch of rules around the colors and the prints, right? Yeah. But before that, then we did wear dresses still, but they could have like different styles. They didn't have to have a straight waist. They didn't have to have the shirt collars. They had like flowers on them sometimes they weren't like plain fabric mm -hmm. they had like v v-shaped you know collars or you know different things it was just a different style of dress and everybody was basically kind of identical <laughs> after he changed the style before that we had a little more freedom with how we wanted to sew our dresses they were still odd they were still odd, but they just weren't as odd. So that's when you first got there. And then what happened after that? So I did witness the children being like, you know, he would rotate the mothers on them. And um, I, so I worked really hard. So I was only there for about a month before he sent me back to Short Creek and told me to write a confession letter because I wasn't talking to him. I was like tongue tied. Every, I was so tired for one thing. And then I, every time he'd come around, which wasn't all the time, I wouldn't talk to him. So he sent me um, back to Short Creek where all the mothers that he had left behind were. All the mothers that had given birth were living. And so I didn't have a lot of bad, bad memories in Short Creek because he um, didn't live there. It was mm -hmm. a target house. He was already 
running from the law. He wasn't on the most wanted list when I met him, but he was running from the law. I have a lot of sad memories, though. I got to witness a lot of the wives that were crying because they were missing their children. And if you if you get to know like the foster care system now that I'm out, that is set up to reunite if at all possible. In this situation, he had ripped away so many kids from people that were weeping and wanted their kids so bad, but like he had just ripped them from regular mothers that really loved their children, mm -hmm. which was a horrific situation. So I did see, I did make my first friend in Short Creek in his family. I mean, I had my sister, but like I had like other sister wives that I made friends with. I was only in Short Creek, I think, for four months. But like I, my sister came with me at first and then she left and um, I stayed for a little bit longer. And that's when I made my first friend. I made my first meal for his family in Short Creek, a huge meal. And I, I remember it really well because I, I selected a recipe that was called carrot casserole. And then after, for the main course, and after I was done, it was pumpkin pie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I had sweet ingredients, which I should have realized, but I didn't. So anyway, nobody said anything. Nobody complained at all. But our main course was pumpkin pie that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And so I had a lot of learning to do, but, you know, I was only 18. If you really think about it, like, even like when you talk about like polygamy and how we were talking about, um, there's a lot of coercion and stuff, even after you're 18, you know, like usually in law, they kind of, it's kind of black and white right now in Utah. If you're underage, it's trafficking. If you're 18, it's kind of like um, supposed to be like a parking ticket in Utah. For me, I think we need to break that up because like the situation changes in middle sometimes. So I don't really think we should focus on polygamy itself. I think we should focus on coercion, like you were saying. Mm. And the main reason why I feel like that is because like if you are a first wife and you have like three kids and your husband comes home with a child, right? It changed in middle. So like you can't get reparations, which is a federal fund funding for people who are in abusive situations like domestic violence, unless it's a felony. Mm. So we don't want to make polygamy a felony, I don't think, but we do want to make it so that if the husband comes home with a child bride, it would be coercion for a felony. You could like break it up. Yeah. So if they, before that, it'd be coercion for a parking ticket, you know, so the wives with the children could have resources to where they could take their children and run instead of become accomplices. Right. I think it's super important that we work on that. Yeah. There's just so many layers to all of that within the coercion. And I mean, having so many wives like he did, it's just it's so hard to imagine what that must have been like for you, for the other wives and for what for him to just feel powerful. But all the while, these women are basically stuck because even if, like, we're going to talk about a little bit later in your story, even if you do escape, you're like, okay, now what? Because I don't have anything. I don't have resources. I don't have anyone on the outside to help me. Yeah. It's just such a hard situation. And before we talk about you going to South Dakota, I wondered if you might be comfortable talking about the type of things that he was doing in Texas that you were a part of or that you witnessed. So after I went to Short Creek, then he sent me back to Texas. Okay. And that's when that happened. Okay. So when I, it talks about it in the documentary. I don't like talking about it very much. You can probably kind of tell that, but like I do think it's important. And the reason why I go into how he tricked everybody into it and also um, how he, um, I think it's important for people like I want to give a voice to the to the wives that um, were 18 years old, you know, like to to cut and dry black and white, it, you know, like is really harsh on them. Yeah. And I know it because like since all of this, like, there was a man named Sam Bateman who was tried in court. He be, he was claiming to be a prophet after Warren and he did similar things and all of the wives were tried and there was 54 felonies in that case. So because the wives were still connected to him, he was telling them how to fight their cases without attorneys, without like if they were actually to tell their story, like a lot of there's about 10 of us out now, I believe, out of the Warren Jeff's wife. So out of 79, 10, you know, that's a really bad ratio. But if you think about like how a lot of them did become accomplices, but like if you actually hear their stories, 
the, a lot of them actually weren't accomplices. Mm-hmm. Like they would still stand in court if you if the church isn't telling them how to fight their case. Some of them probably wouldn't go to jail. Yeah. And now that there's ten of us that are out, if any of them, anybody ever did go and attack them, they probably would get an attorney and they probably would tell their story. And if you were to talk to some of them, you'd probably hear why I had littler kids on the property in Texas. And what was I supposed to do? Like in my case, I didn't have little kids, but I turned on him mm-hmm. and it became like a more, even bigger target. Like he put me on a pedestal and said, don't be like her pretty much in his family because I turned on him. Mm-hmm. I successfully avoided him until he was put in prison. I was never brought back into another situation like that, which was rare for any of his wives because he was so controlling. he 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 even when i did avoid him i went to like a house in hiding which was a different location told him i wasn't going to pray to ensure i don't go back to the holy land cuz i didn't want to be there yeah i didn't say that but i told him i'm going to read and prepare myself further cuz i didn't want a bunch of repercussions but any i i witnessed people crying i witnessed wives um trying to fight him in a sense but he would say, you just need to pray harder. You can't leave this land. And he was trying to drag them multiple times into the situation with coercion or any way possible to make them a full accomplice because then he would tighten their cage so much. I heard him in training saying the world doesn't want you. So it tightened their prison, their mental prison. Mm-hmm. So tight. I can't even imagine that tight of a mental prison because I didn't have that. Even when he'd say you're an accomplice, you know, stuff like that. I wasn't a full accomplice i knew enough about law and the world that if i wasn't pulled into multiple situations and there wasn't going to be records dug up on me later you know that were real you know (laughs) and also like your conscience doesn't eat you alive so bad if you're not like participating in illegal terrible things you know so for me i definitely think it's super important to talk about how he tricked everybody, even in the introduction. And then you turn around and there's underage brides in the room. Um, And then to walk out of there and fight your way out, like of this situation where there's a guard tower on this property. There's like people driving around every 15 minutes. You are brought there in the first place. So you don't even know where the neighbors are and you don't know how far away they are. And you only have maybe 15 minutes before the next person is going to recognize that you're gone. If you aren't already being hunted in the house because you're on 24 hour watch, which I was Mm -hmm. after I started questioning, I started realizing that there was problems everywhere. It felt like a concentration camp to me where most people wanted to be there. They, even if they did go there, they didn't have such, they weren't fighting war and just directly. So like, if you think about like, Warren Jeffs had 10,000 followers before he became the leader. Then he becomes the leader and you don't know exactly how many fall off because he scatters them everywhere. But it's kind of like when you're going through that, you turn on the leader. It's it's kind of like standing on, like they talk about the fire and you have all the shadows. In your mind, you still have 10,000 people that might be after you. You think about um, domestic violence and there's usually two, maybe sometimes the families will be behind it and that's pretty bad. Because it gets pretty bad even with two. Think about 10,000 people and deciding that you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn on this leader who probably nobody's ever going to believe you anyway. Because the leader has trained them their whole life that God would kill him before he'd lead the people astray. Before God would allow him to lead the people astray, God would kill him. Mm -hmm. So that's how indoctrinated these FLDS were. They keep justifying. They keep trying to fill in the cracks if he couldn't have done it the records must be fabricated like they just keep trying to justify the abuser Mm -hmm. in this situation so why would they believe me even though i have firsthand experience there's hardly a chance they're going to even look my way yeah it's so twisted and psychotic and the things that he did seemingly very purposeful like making you an accomplice or I, there was something in the documentary that stood out to me that you were talking about how when he would take wives who were 12 or 13, he would say, I'm just going to protect them and make sure that they don't start dating or this or that. Yeah. But then that day in the room when you realize that they're all standing there naked and he's smiling at them and looking at them and you realized, oh, he is actively 
doing these things with them as if they were married. He's not just protecting them. I'm sure that was such a heart-stopping moment when you realized he he lied. He he wasn't just being this fatherly figure. He was actually participating in these things with them, and that's why he's in prison forever, which, thank God, but... Right. I can only imagine what you were going through in that moment, all of you standing there, and he's enjoying all of this in a way that's so disgusting, and he's trying to make you have interactions with each other. It's it's just twisted, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. Yeah, it, it was like an overwhelming feeling of disgust. Yeah. Like just darkness and disgust. Like I remember feeling it when I noticed there was an underage right in the room. I didn't even understand that the brain developed at 26 until after I left. But like I just knew in my gut there had to be something going on deeper. And also if you think about like my childhood when I went and tattled because like I was molested as a child, even though he didn't take off his clothes, I – um went and tattled and all of that because he made me take off my clothes. I had a little bit of understanding that this is a bad thing. Yeah. But the overwhelming feeling of disgust and, you know, I don't know how anybody could go through that and not feel that because I think it's a God-given gift. Even if it's in the darkest time when you don't have a lot of knowledge, I think everybody feels that feeling of disgust at first. Now, if you ignore that and you keep going back and you keep like saying, trying to justify it or trying to find a reason, I think it can cloud it. That's why I, I'm so passionate about people understanding and recognizing those feelings because like I've also witnessed the people and the hatred because after he went to prison, then I started to research my routes out because I didn't want to be brought into multiple things to cloud my conscience before that. He goes to prison because like people XFLDS, you find those records and they use them against him. It took two years while I was in houses in hiding, different houses in hiding, but like it wasn't on compounds where he was. I I moved like a lot of times, but he couldn't take me back to the Holy Lands where he could have children because I was openly rebellious. He didn't want me to send me to Short Creek because Short Creek was people who were still trying to be on those lands. Mm-hmm. So he didn't want to mix the knowledge. So he made these houses in hiding that were in the middle. I'm going around in these houses in hiding and they capture the records. They figure it out. They put him in prison for life. The ex-FLDS people, Elisa Wall, Rebecca Messer. Yeah. And the records that you're talking about, these are actual video recordings, audio recordings of him doing things to these children, which he called disgustingly heavenly sessions right? and made them think that it was part of a temple ceremony. And these are the records that they got a hold of that you're speaking of? Yeah, nobody was that was actually in the room at the time that those happened testified in court. Like it was ex-FLDS people who believed the records were true. Whoa. And now I'm out. And I didn't even know how bad it got. Like he tied down the so I didn't know how bad it got because I wasn't in all the bad, bad, bad stuff, but I knew it was headed in that direction. So I get out and find out about that, you know, way later. But like when I found out, I was like, I believe it all. And and I actually have testified in federal court now because I had a case last year and not last year, two years ago in September. And last year they finalized it. But we had a seven-year case after I did escape, which was about five years, three to five years from the time. By the time he got caught and went to jail, I I think it was about three to five years, somewhere in there that I was um, escaped myself and then uh, filed a case, which took seven years. And I just testified and then two years ago. And then, you know, so I've been out almost 12 years, but it took a while to get all this put together because he'd already been in prison for life. He's been in prison for life for like Mm -hmm. 16 years or something. So I don't don't know if I'm getting all the numbers right, but I do know um, it was pretty fast after I left that we filed the case. But it took me a long time to escape. And then the reason being is because when he did get caught, then I started to research my routes out. But the people around me, he put like the hardcore people, the people that would do anything he said. And also, I believe some of them had already clouded their conscience so bad 
that they were angry at me because I had a lie about me. And, and I've seen that happen several times in my life where if you really are innocent, sometimes people, they can't handle that light. So they, they attack you harder. So I had all these people cause he had the right, he had, he told us where to live. He told us who to live with, what food came into the house. So I was targeted so bad after he realized he could never make me an accomplice, a full accomplice. Yeah. He knew that you knew too much. Yeah. He knew I knew too much. Yeah. Yeah. And he wasn't willing to let you get out and you did escape multiple times and they kept bringing you back, right? Yeah. Part of the pro- problem was, is that I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where would be safe enough for me. So when it talks about in the documentary, when I escaped the first time in South Dakota, they actually put me in a shelter for one night and I didn't dare stay in that town because it was so close to the compound in South Dakota. So I actually went back to, I didn't go back to the same compound. I went back to Colorado city, which is where my family was. So I was the first one in Warren Jess family to make it back to Colorado city after he took his whole family away. And I went there because I figured they might not understand all of what I had been through. I'd been gone for so long. Um, so when I went back to Colorado city, my father and his children, they had just been kind of abandoned and they were so behind the times. Like they didn't understand any of what I had been through. So it was kind of like coming back from military, I believe where you're really on edge. I was super on edge, like so scared for all the kids and worried about what they're going to go through. And they're all just like, what is going on? She's And my father actually went to the bishop here in, in Colorado City at that time was Lyle Jeffs, who was Warren's brother. And he asked him, what did they do to my daughter? Because she's not the same person. Mm. And he told him, it's none of your business. Oh. Yeah. And you were in South Dakota for a couple of years, right? This isn't just a short period of time. No, this is years of being targeted, harassed. Like basically every single hour I was like, I didn't dare eat, you know, like I would, I would, I didn't dare walk to the kitchen because it was so intense and it just got worse. So every caretaker I would go to, um, they moved me like three times and I would stay in those locations for like a year. So like every person I'd go to, they would tell them I was worthy of blood atonement. That's a really big deal to be worthy of blood atonement. Like blood atonement is not a simple thing because like the opposite of that is, is basically if you shed innocent blood in their doctrine, then you'll never make it into heaven. So they would hesitate every time I'd, I'd also help them hesitate because I would be like, you don't want to mix up on this. Cause you won't make it into heaven if you, mm. if you shed my blood and I really haven't done anything. So that's so smart of you. And I would use the doctrine I had studied through those two years that I was waiting for Warren Jeffs to be caught. Cause I knew he was on the most wanted by then. So when I was, I married him at 18 by 19 about, I was in houses in hiding. It was about 21 that I started being harassed when he was caught. I think, I believe it was around 21 years old. Um, and I had read that whole time to avoid more punishments and stuff. I had kept my mind busy, but all the only things I had to read was Warren Jeff's interpretations, which is what everybody around me wanted to hear. So basically it did save my life because, um, they wanted all his interpretations anyway. I don't use it anymore, but at that time frame, I used it a lot. So I knew where to find what he, he had taught over the years and so when people would target me, I would be like, oh, you, this is what he says. And he he also had a doctrine where uh, he was the leader. And if you had an impression from the real God of how to do the something, you had to ask him if it was from God or the devil. And he had the right to say, oh, that was from the devil. So I had to use his words against himself. I had to say, oh, he said this on yeah. this day because he could never be from the devil. So it would it would ensure that I would have opportunities rather than um, take away those opportunities. So I was harassed for basically three years. For three years, you were living with the fear of at any time 
anyone in this house could kill me with the justification of blood atonement and you're trying to get them off of your back. That's absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I would stay awake at night. I would fight sleep because I was afraid of being strangled at times. Like, you know, there was so much going into it. And it just got worse over time. So at first it was just like, what is going on? You know, and then you kind of figure it out and then you start to, it just got worse and worse and worse. After over three years, it's a lot of time. And um, it was pretty intense by the time I came back yeah. to Short Creek. I get back to Short Creek and then my family doesn't know anything about it. And so I'm like oh, super on edge. I, I don't know how to not be because my whole body has been changed. My my brain has just been on survival mode for so long. And even still, like it's been 12 years since I have escaped. I don't think I'll ever not have side effects from that. When I was in the FLDS, they, at 23, they actually put me on Seroquel for the first time. And by the time I escaped, I was 26. So like Seroquel is like a really strong medication to kind of make you docile. But they basically um, put me on it so that I um, would, they told me it was for sleep. They didn't even tell me what it was for, really, what it really is for. I had no internet to go search up all its things. I had to kind of rely on them. And when the very first day they gave it to me, I didn't know what was a lethal dose, how much wasn't. I didn't actually meet the doctor the first day they gave it to me. So I took it because I didn't have a choice, but I really didn't know if I would even wake up that day. And what is the medication for normally? It's, it's a mood stabilizer. So it's like to make you docile and, you know, kind of like, but they did give it to me in slow doses, which I credit to the doctor, actually. I think, I think the doctor did keep me alive. He actually told me when I did meet him later, um, one time he said, if you're fighting the medication, you can actually take more. And I think he was balancing out the fact that he had gone to school. He had got all the training and Warren Jeffs was prescribing my medicine because he told the doctor something about, I don't know the words, but something about his family was held over his head. If he didn't give me the medicine Warren Jess wanted him to, even though Warren Jess hasn't gone to school, then he would take his wife and kids away from him, which oh my gosh. he was a member of the church. So they had been gifts to each other. They were appointed marriage. They had been told to marry each other. And Warren Jeffs had taken families away. And so I think he was afraid of that. And since I have done the documentary, I've had people come forward and apologize. Like I was expecting a big backlash, but actually I got a lot of mm. apologies. People saying, we didn't realize that you weren't guilty. We didn't know why we were prescribing you, you know, like helping get you medicine. We knew that was happening, stuff like that. One guy actually said he left the church because he was told to kill me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was a very trying time for everyone because like that was a super you know when you're told to do something like that what would you do you know like you know it's a really hardcore line and people didn't know me and they they'd search my history my history would be brought up multiple times when caretakers finally just came to the end of the rope and was like there's no sin in her past big enough to justify this crime right now i can't do it then they would pass me to another caretaker. Are you comfortable talking about the time where they tried to put that on you? Yeah, that's kind of tough because like um, there's a lot of details that do make it really clear, you know, like, um, but there's some that are pretty hard to make it clear enough. So basically in the documentary, I think they did a really good job where they talked about how there was a reservoir close by. They kind of just went and stuck with the big details. There was a lot more into it. So there was a reservoir close by. Um, the family told me to um, they were going to kill me or I had to kill myself. So they basically said, if you, if you kill yourself, we'll tell everybody it was an accident. But if you don't kill yourself, we will kill you and tell everybody you did it yourself. Oh. Yeah. So it was a catch-22. But... Um, so there was a reservoir close by, which I am always so grateful it was a reservoir instead of a cliff. In some of the other stories I've heard, they used a cliff. Oh, my gosh. So there was no, like, it was kind of like, yeah, 
like a, a worse situation. So for me, I want, I wasn't sure, like in my mind, I was still questioning. I'm like, are they really that serious about killing me? So I went to the reservoir and I climbed in the reservoir and it talks about that. And then um, in my mind, I was actually processing, like thinking if I'm in the water, they will have to be within three minutes to rescue me because you can only be underwater for like three minutes. So I should be able to see them because there's like, you know, trees around, but like from a certain distance, I should be able to see them if they're actually around me because it was far away. The trees were quite far away. So I was like, I should be able to tell if there's somebody actually close enough to rescue me Mm -hmm. if I'm in the water. But if I'm not in the water, they'll just say, I could see you from the window. I could see you from anywhere. And I knew you were safe. So they didn't come closer. But I waited in that water for a long time and they never came. They never even were around. They totally were planning on (sighs) me killing myself and just letting it be. So like I... I climbed out of the water after a while and I actually cried for like an hour at least. But um, I didn't dare run to a neighbor. I didn't know where they were either, but like I didn't dare even try that route because I was afraid of being shot. So I decided I'll just run back to the house that I was at because they had other wives in the house that by this time would know there was something wrong. Because I had had jumped out the window. So I went back to the house and they brought out a telephone and they had me call um, somebody higher, like somebody higher in the pyramid. It was actually Warren's favorite wife. And I talked to her and I couldn't, like he stood there, the caretaker stood next to me. So I was crying on the phone, but I couldn't actually explain to her what happened because he was listening and he was listening. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't explain what really happened. And, um, she finally just said, are you not communicating well? And I said, no, I'm not communicating well. So she, um, said, we're going to move you. And they did move me to, uh, a new location within a week. It didn't really end, you know, the harassment stuff didn't end until I left the church. But, um, that was that story where she she did save my life. She and I really appreciate her for that. Because I didn't know how to explain anything to her. And somebody could have just said, You're wrong, you know, you're doing bad, you know, you should just stay there. Could have gone in any direction. There was two times in my story that his favorite wife saved my life. So like I I feel bad when people target her because I don't know if she was up there that high just to help people. But a lot of people get angry at me when I say that because of like how bad the trauma got for the underage bride. She was one of the ones in the room when they tied her down and stuff. But it's like, it's just, you know, I don't think that was right. And I don't know how she feels, but like, I haven't talked to her since, since we both left. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. And I think it's okay to give her credit for helping you and, this is your story and this is your perspective and in your perspective, she did save your life. And so I think that's worth something and it's, it's okay to say that. I think so too. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, Brielle. Everything that you went through is just so, it's so much for anyone to handle. Any one of these stories that you have mentioned is just a lot. And so I'm just so proud of where you are today and how you're doing and how you are helping other people. It's truly amazing and inspiring. And I know that it's not just completely gone. Of course, trauma tends to linger. And that's why we have to do a lot of work to get ourselves out of those holes. But even just coming on and sharing these stories is so brave of you and and courageous. And so I just want to thank you before we move on for opening up about all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I still have like, even though I have this big picture about like helping all the wives and stuff, get their own voice. Some of them are still in denial of it. So like yeah. right now in history, a lot of them are like my, you know, even the kids, my mother would have never done that. I'm just like, well, your mother did that because of you. <laughs> you know, like she wanted to protect you so bad. She would do anything. Yeah. But, um, but they, 
don't always understand that. But like, I think I'm on the right track though. If I just stay true to what I feel, I really do feel like I will be able to testify for some of them that were crying, some of them that were kicked out, you know, and you know, some of those meetings and stuff like for the time, you know, the people that I saw, I really believe that there's going to come a day when it's really crucial to have witnesses. I I do feel like it was a really hard time for all of them to some degree, but like, I, I do believe that there are some of them that could have done better. You know, they didn't have to become perpetrators. They may have felt they had to under duress or whatever. But if you really think about like a large scale of everybody targeting each other, um, who suffers the most? I think the ones that suffer the worst are the children. That's what I witnessed. Because they would put the children on the front lines to take the, the, the hits for them. And, uh, and they did get hurt still. They'd lose opportunities. They didn't even comprehend. But, you know, it's still pretty sad. Wow. So we are about to wrap up this episode, but I want to end with how you ended up transferring to your brother's home after all of this, what was going on there. And then in the next episode, we'll talk about how you escaped. Um, I did go back to Short Creek. Um, I stayed in Short Creek for a little while before I left. And the reason being is because I wanted to help the children before I left. So what I did is I I wrote to Warren and I told him what, while I was under my father's care. Because like for a long time in those three years, they wouldn't let my letters go. So the, the caretakers harassing me, um, they wouldn't actually take my letters that I wrote to Warren to him. The prison system, I could send it through the mail, but he doesn't always read those ones. He'll read like in the church, they have like a location they send all the mail to. They filter through it and then they send it to him in prison. Mm. Well, my letters weren't making it to him. So um, when I, before I left, I just really wanted to write. I wanted him to know. So my father would take them to him. Like my father, I had a more confidence in my father because he didn't even know what was going on. So I wrote to him about all the people who had hurt me and the reasons why I believe they did. And I didn't lie. I did the true stories. But within one week, all of my abusers showed up at Short Creek. Oh, my gosh. All the main people. They had all lost a position in the church, which means like if they were a bishop, they wouldn't be a bishop. If they had just a family, they might have lost their family. Like it was a pretty serious thing. So um, when that happened is actually when I got locked up in my brother's house in solitary confinement. So that was, yeah, a really scary day for me. But I felt like if I got them out of their positions, then um, if Warren Jeffs would, you know, did, he would be the one that would do that. But like, if he decided to do that, it would help the children because the children, um, they would have to retrain people to be in those positions, mm -hmm. to be that harsh and all of that. It would take them a lot of years before they had leadership that would be as harsh as they had been to me. So the children yeah. might get a, break, a breather in there. So it was worth it to me to do that before I exited the church. That's so interesting that he would do that because it seems like they were acting on his orders, but then when you told him what happened, he made them step down. I don't know how much he knew and how much he didn't, but I do believe he knew quite a bit more. But he has his own justice system, and I understood it really well. I think he has a way of, like, blaming it on me, even though he does it. You know, like, I think he was pretty determined that I didn't live through it. So if he sends all the abusers and he makes them step down and makes them really angry, they might try harder. So you're thinking his plan was to make it backfire so that – because having them all in the same place where you are is terrifying. I think so. I don't know. There's a lot of assumptions, but – he has his own justice system, and, and part of his justice system is, like, when he's in prison, he can't really check on people, so he, he relies a lot on their letters, and not only their letters, like, who else is in the house at the time, so that he can get, like, a lot of information on the same topic. It's just, like, a complicated justice system, because he can't really even check on it to see if it's even accurate. So in my situation, I didn't lie about the situations, but... There were people, I believe, that did get corrected for things they never did. All you really had to do was put in the letter like a confidence, like something that only Warren Jess would know. And he would believe that what, everything else you said was true. Because he had no way of checking on it. He didn't really talk to God. So um, 
in my situation, I didn't lie because I wanted them to get the right situations. I wanted them to know that, you know, they were the right, um, yeah, the truth about the situation, but it also put me more at risk. So if I had lied about their situations and they didn't know who did it for sure, that might have helped me, but like, I didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we're going to end the story here. You're locked in your brother's home and you have just dethroned all these abusers, but now they're in the same city as you. And we're going to talk about how you escaped in the next episode. So let oh, me take a deep breath because there's so much we just went over. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> let's just jump into a lighter note, which is our Linda Listen moment. Um, any sassy statement to anyone who's pissed you off, you have many. Or if you'd prefer to go the inspirational route, you can do that, too. So my statement is usually about, like, positive. I like to be positive better. So I like to think about, like, um, I usually like freedom. Like when I realized I had freedom in my life for the first time after I escaped, then um, it was such a big deal to me. And it still is kind of in my mind that um, I, I want that for everyone. I really want everyone to break these chains psychologically and even physically at times to where hopefully they will get a taste of that. So Linda, listen, you deserve freedom. Yeah. It's beautiful. All right. Well, thank you again for sharing. Um, we have so much more to talk about in the next episode, all the work you are doing with the Dream Center and how you are helping others escape and reestablish their lives. And for those who are interested, the website is shortcreekdreamcenter.org. And you can find Brielle at briellecker.com on Instagram at Brielle Decker and Facebook. Brielle Decker Blanchard. We'll put all the links in the description so that you can go and check that out. Um, but before we go, do you have any other final thoughts? I, I'm really happy I got to um, go into like as much detail as I did. Like I think it was good. Good. Like most of the time, it, it I don't have. I don't get to say as much as I did this time. So that was good. You had good questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. I just want to really give the space to our guests to explain the story in the way that they want to explain it. And I'm glad it was a good experience or hopefully a good experience. And I'm really yeah, looking forward to the next episode with you. So thank you again. Yeah. All right. So for those watching, thank you so much for being here. Leave those words of encouragement in the comments. It boosts the algorithm. It's so nice for our guests and myself to read. And if you want to support the podcast, you can get some of our merch if you're interested at coltstoconsciousness.com under the merch tab. And um, for those who just saw the pregnancy announcement, we do have our little onesies available now that say, I don't want to be in your cult cult free kid <laughs> and one with our our logo on it that's um gonna be for our little one coming in march and what else if you want to go to costa rica there's seven spots left we'll put the link in the description as well and if you'd like to become a patron you can do so at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness our newest patrons joy sarah jennifer and john thank you so much for your support it really means a lot to us and i think that's it if you like this video i'll leave two here below that you can check out and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>